My name is David Elfstrom. I'm an engineer in the province of Ontario, Canada. And ventilation is a very important factor. It's the main difference between indoors and outdoors during this pandemic. So a quick definition of ventilation, we've already talked about it. Here's a quick definition. Supplying clean outdoor air to the space and removing stale indoor air. There's three main types of ventilation for classrooms. Natural, basically through windows. It is inherently unreliable. And there's many cases where the windows just can't open very far for other reasons of safety and security. Second, common in around 1960s type construction, partial mechanical ventilation. This is a classroom with an exhaust fan in it, usually close to where the blackboard is. And it exhausts some of the stale air, but the, the air that comes in either comes from other classrooms and other locations, or it comes in through cracks and open windows. So it's coming in and it's not filtered. The third type is a mechanical ventilation system. It uses fans in a system to provide outdoor air, filter it, and also remove stale air. So when there's an outbreak, if it's, at a, if it's a food outbreak in a restaurant or uh, a water supply outbreak, the first thing you do is send engineers in to have a look, or not, not for food perhaps, but for, for water outbreak, it would be send, send engineers in to have a look at it. We need to be doing that when there is an outbreak in a congregated setting like this for a classroom if, to check the ventilation systems. One way that we can do that, even before there's an outbreak, is by measuring CO2. And for that, Dr. Poppendick. Okay, uh, thank you, David. Um, before I start, I wanna note that the methods presented today are not um, a recommendation or endorsement from my employer. So um, where does CO2 come from in a classroom? Your lungs exchange oxygen, with, oxygen in air with carbon dioxide. And importantly, the amount of carbon dioxide that we emit depends on our age, activity, and our size. The air we breathe in is about 0.04% carbon dioxide, and the air we breathe out is about 0.4% carbon dioxide. Given this relatively high concentration compared to other chemicals and emissions from people, carbon dioxide is a good proxy for emissions from humans. In fact, we can use it to determine the fraction of air you breathe in that has been in other people's lungs. For instance, if the indoor carbon dioxide concentration is 2,000 ppm, or 2,000 carbon dioxide molecules per 1 million total air molecules, and the outside concentration is 420 ppm, then 4% of every breath a person takes in a room will consist of air that's been in somebody's lungs. For airborne viruses, we want to keep that rebreathed fraction and carbon dioxide concentration as low as possible. If we want to use CO2 as a, a carbon dioxide as a ventilation fluid, we need to make sure that there are no non-human sources um, that are going to impact concentration, such as indoor combustion or vehicles outside, out, idling outside indoor air takes. In addition, it's also important to note that CO2 is, not a pro, is, is only a proxy for human emissions and does not account for many other things that impact our indoor air quality. If we want to use consumer grade CO2 monitors, we need to make sure that we understand they have limitations. Monitors using NDIR sensors can have errors depending, non-NDIR sensors can have errors depending on their calibration chemical. Um, although NDIR sensors report values to three significant digits, they're only accurate to about 50 ppm. Finally, all of these sensors can drift over time. So it's important that we measure the difference between indoor and outdoor CO2 concentrations as that gives us the most accurate and reliable data that we can use. <clears throat> to use CO2 sensors to check ventilation, we need to place the sensor outside for five minutes. Make sure the room to be measured is occupied with normal occupants and use patterns, but has no non-human CO2 sources. Locate the, center in the, middle, the sensor in the middle of the room and log the data for a full day. Ventilation changes dependent upon the windows, operation, season, weather, and HVAC operation. So we need to repeat this measurement on a regular schedule. Carbon dioxide concentrations build up in a classroom over time. This is why you can't just take one measurement at one point during the day. Rather, it needs to be logged for the entire day. In this case, you can see when kids entered a room, went out for research, recess, and the peak concentration, all of which would give very different single point readings. 
The data of interest for us here is the highest average value over approximately 15 minutes. In this case, it's about 1200 ppm or about 800 ppm above the outside concentration. The power of the CO2 monitor is that in this portable classroom, the CO2 concentration was about 2100 ppm the day before the teacher was given a CO2 monitor. They were able to actively open windows and doors to reduce the CO2 concentration by 900 ppm. ASHRAE is the North American Standard Organization for Operating and Building Operating Buildings, and it provides standard values that classrooms should be ventilated at in pre-pandemic times. In the case, in this case, ASHRAE recommends the ventilation for classrooms with five to eight-year-old that is um, typically would result in CO2 concentrations that are about 550 ppm above outside concentrations or 970 ppm. This air change rate is above, roughly about 2.6 for an average um, classroom, size classroom. Pre-pandemic studies have shown that <clears throat> most classrooms are not ventilated to these standards um, and typically have higher CO2 concentrations. Since the pandemic, several organizations have suggested roughly doubling the effective ventilation rate in classrooms to 15 liters per second per person. And this would result in concentrations that are about 400 to 500 ppm above the outside concentrations or result in effective air change rates of about five to six per hour. The bottom line is that CO2 concentrations vary with time, room, season, and weather pattern. A single measurement from a few minutes is unlikely to capture the dynamic ranges or give actionable data. High CO2 measurements do not necessarily mean there is a risk and low CO2 values do not also meet, signify that a space is safe, only that it's safer. Finally, CO2 monitoring <clears throat> of ventilation is but one component of overall risk reduction strategy to move viruses from airs that includes portable air cleaners and HVAC filtration. Thank you. I'll turn it back to David. So back onto the, the topic of uh, portable air cleaners. For pandemic purposes, using a portable air cleaner is equivalent to outdoor air. And although Dr. Corsi has talked about the uh, a given example of the sizing, there, there's some other things to, to, to take note of. And some of the lessons that have been learned from both Ontario and other jurisdictions where they've deployed many uh, portable air cleaners into, into classrooms is that you wanna have as large a capacity as possible for the air cleaner, a large clean air delivery rate. Second, Focus on the noise as well. You don't want it to interfere with instruction. So they're rated at the, the highest speed and that's also the highest noise. So even if you oversize it, you can still slow it down and at least get a lower noise. Third, hold the extras. Avoid ionizers and other technologies and bells and whistles that are gonna add in some more cost. Focus on the air delivery and then prioritize to the naturally ventilated and exhaust only classrooms. You may need two or three of them for equity with their mechanically ventilated counterparts. And so for more on filtration and making your own air cleaner, we'll turn it over to Jim. Okay, thank you. And uh, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, ASHRAE is uh, the recommendation is for MERV 13 filters or the highest possible compatible with HVAC systems. Uh, here's a little bit of an idea of where that fits in. Um, two, two charts, one uh, efficiency on particles one to three microns, the other one particles 0.3 to one micron. Uh, you'll see that MERV 13 filters in both categories are substantially better than the other filters. Uh, so that's why the recommendation is what it is. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, here's the problem, availability. You know, it's great to say MERV 13 was what we needed. Uh, it was 5% of the market all of a sudden in, in 2020, the demand went to 40% of the market. You couldn't get MERV 13 filters. I just talked to a major manufacturer last week. They have up their capacity. That is not going to be as much of a problem this year. That's not an excuse that school districts and universities can use. Uh, cost, it's definitely more expensive, um, but thankfully the MERV 13 prices are stable 
then you have to consider true cost, which is um, the filters, the cost of the filters versus the risk involved. So it's a very, very low relative cost. And then compatibility of equipment. Um, and again, the concerns are that the increased resistance of the MERV-13 filters are going to tax the older HVAC systems. But if you look at it, um, the next part of the slide, we've got a MERV-10, a MERV-11, and a MERV-13. All three of these are relatively close in resistance. So if you're going with, if they're going with filters that are uh, pleated filters, well-made, that is not as much of a concern as uh, it has been made out to be. Uh, plus the MERV-13 gets dirty faster. You're gonna have to change it out faster, but I think that's what you're trying to do with a filter anyhow. It's a good thing that the filter is, uh, is getting dirty. Um, some school districts uh, have gone to MERV-11, which is perfectly acceptable. It's a, uh, it's a good uh, alternative. They're worried about their equipment. Uh, and MERV-11 MERV was is certainly better than a MERV-8 or a MERV-10. Um, and then but right now what we're seeing is that schools are either all in, they're, they're buying MERV-13 for every building, or they're all out. They're buying no MERV-13 at all. Uh, and, and my position would be that, that every school district has buildings that have plenty of capacity in their units they should be spending the money on MERV-13 filters rather than other things. It's a very small percentage of the overall um, building budget uh, and, and a very good investment at this time. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, so most of you have probably heard of the Corsi Rosenthal box. It's a low cost, do it yourself, easy, easy to assemble and effective air cleaner. The picture on your left is one that's fully built. Uh, it has a tape shroud. David has done some great jobs, work on uh, making sure that we know exactly how, how much of a shroud is needed. Um, and then the, uh, then the diagram on the right Volunteer did this and put a nice shroud on top. It's very simple to make. Uh, next slide, please. So here's some of the advantages of this Corsi Rosenthal box. I, if you have the money, I would definitely recommend buying a good high quality HEPA air purifier. But if you don't have the money, this is a great alternative. The supplies are very easy to find. All you need are four or five MERV-13 filters a box fan and tape. Uh, it's inexpensive, costs less than $100 to make it. Uh, simple construction. And then I'm really serious about this. If you can seal a box, you can make a Corsi Rosenthal box air cleaner and just really that simple. Um, it's powerful. Um, it, it, by using this box design, you avoid the resistance of the filters. You also create negative pressure inside the box as the air is drawn out through the, from the fan. So it's uh, 500 feet per minute, 24 inches from the fan. Um, you're not really going to, going to get the same thing even from good HEPA air purifiers. It's efficient. Um, if you look at like 2.5 microns, 94% efficient, five microns, 95% efficient. These are particles in the target range that we're looking at, even down to 0.3 microns, 58%. And by the way, you'll get this question, uh, and, and uh, Lindsay referred to this earlier, where uh, people think that filters uh, don't uh, capture particles lower than 0.3 microns. And that's absolutely incorrect. Filters include HEPA filters, MERV-13 filters, they all get more efficient because of the way that, that, that filtration works. They get more efficient on these, on these smaller sized particles. Uh, it's safe. Um, UL has studied this and uh, they found that uh, it, it actually meets all the limits for safety. Uh, we had a lot of concerns early on about whether or not it, motors would overheat or we'd have strain on the motor. And uh, even with one filter on a, on a box fan, it's uh, within the, uh, the prescribed limits. And it's relatively quiet. It's 51 decibels at, at six feet. 
And finally, um, next slide, please. It's scalable. It is a type of thing that any school could do. Uh, it's a type of thing that could be a project. You could have 10 year olds doing a science project and making something that would make their classrooms uh, safer and, uh, and, and re reduce any viral count that's in the classroom. Um, it's, it's a great, great way to um, have people learn and feel like they're helping uh, with COVID. Mm -hmm.